We do have time this afternoon for questions, and I know that uh, we've got a lot of Tom Woods fans here, and, and this is also your chance to ask Lou Rockwell any question you might have on your mind. And, and I will say this, getting to know Lou over, I guess I've known him about 10 years, is he just knows everybody in the liberty movement. He's been around, and he's been in some pretty incredible rooms over the years with some pretty incredible people. You'd be, you'd be amazed. Including this one. You'd be amazed at who Lou knows or, and who Lou has met over the years. To who's who. So let me start with a question for, of my own for, for Tom. Uh, Trump, the, the Trump phenomenon. I told Lou, Trump is a verb. I mean, when you Trump someone in cards, or that means you know, Trump. Right, like Trump Vafa, right? But a bush, a bush, a bush is a plant. It just sits there. You know, and I was just thinking to myself, you know, God, of all the names you'd want to have to be a, a politician, it wouldn't be Bush. So is, is Trump's PC, is Trump's anti-PCism for real, is it a, or is it a facade? I'm not entirely sure. I, my guess is it's for Thank real. You. But he's certainly getting a real response, and it's showing that uh, you know a tremendous number of people have had it. Uh, they're not interested in it anymore. When we see um, Megyn Kelly or other purveyors of this sort of stuff booed by a Republican, pretty much establishment crowd, um, you know I, th I think uh, I think Trump Trump is to be commended for raising issues that have been suppressed for a very long time, including the whole PC issue, and uh, that's why he's hated, not because. He's a clown or whatever the other arguments are against him. And of course, I don't think anybody should be president. No one deserves to have that kind of power. But, but uh, I must say, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. I hope he keeps uh, talking more about PC. And uh, I think it does a lot of good, despite the screams of the elite about uh, how horrible it is to raise these issues. It's bigoted. It's criminal you know, and all the rest. It's good to discuss these things. And I, would, I, I think it, it's having a good effect. I don't have anything to add to that, but I'll say, but I will add something, I guess. <laughs> um, I had Lou come on to my show. There's on, on, the, on my bio, you can see I do a podcast every day, every weekday. And when, when Lou came on to talk about the Trump phenomenon, it was one of the top five most listened to episodes ever out of the 503 that I've done. The, only, the, the top episode ever most listened to of all the libertarian theory I've covered was Lou and me talking about the first GOP debate. So for all you folks who say, oh, I don't like politics and forget it, you're lying. <laughs> all right, this is a question from Stephen Cho. He lives in Richardson, Texas. It's for Tom. It says, the right always accuses the left of political correctness. But is the right wing also guilty of its own brand of political correctness? Oh, that's a great question, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. Where's Stephen? L let's give him a star for that question. Wherever. <laughs> okay. There you go. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, it it does, and I'll I'll get to the content of it in just a minute. But I do think that just as a matter of fact, I think it is fundamentally a left wing phenomenon. Uh, and and it, and Tom was right to point out the influence of Herbert Marcuse, for example. I think it is definitely a left-wing phenomenon. However, given that some people in the conservative movement have left-wing backgrounds, they can't help themselves. This is just, they're hardwired to act this way. So they've brought it into the conservative movement. And I would say, for instance, uh, on, on foreign policy, there is certainly a political correctness that goes on there. And, and certainly when it comes to a, a certain, what, what Jeff and I call a certain democracy in the Middle East, you know, by which, of course, we mean Lebanon. There are certain, you know, there's a certain opinion that everyone's expected to have. And if you have a mildly differing opinion or an extremely differing opinion, then this doesn't mean that you're to be refuted. You know, you're a terrible person who wants to kill everybody or something. You can't have a rational discussion with anybody. So they use anti-Semitism the way the left uses racism, exactly the same way. And they do it knowing full well that 99% of the people they're talking to are not anti-Semites. They, they know that. They're not, they're not stupid. I mean, they may be blockheads on some things, but they're not really stupid on an intellectual level. They know that this can ruin people. And they, love, they feel like, we're sick of the left using words that can ruin people. We want a, our own word that can ruin people. So I would say, I would point to it there, but maybe Lou has some other examples. 
Well, I think the you know even uh, Rush Limbaugh and, and people like that use uh, they have not only on the war issues but on uh, um, domestic issues too. Very unfortunate. It's spread throughout the whole political culture, and because it's so effective, because it does silence people, does smear them, does shut them up. Um, so this is this has become the norm. So for Trump to denounce it uh, is unheard of, and they're all. Uh, for the most part, they're all outraged at him. Some are hopping on the bandwagon. We'll see if it actually is a bandwagon. Um, Republican Party elites are very powerful, and they control the rules. In fact, they made massive changes in the rules for holding a convention after Ron Paul's uh, significant success the last time, even though they cheated him out of a bunch of delegates, uh, to try to prevent anything like that from ever happening again, any, any a nominee who wasn't approved. So there's still many... Uh, no matter how Trump is doing the polls or does in, does in the primaries, many, many uh, um, roadblocks ahead for him uh, and for any other candidate who might bug, bug the power elite. Um, so we can see the right wing is using the politically correct argument against Trump even more than the left does. The uh, look at National Review or similar conservative publications, they're just full of, na of political correctness from page one to page 99 or whatever, how many pages on the issue? This question, I think, is, is great. It's by Michael, from Michael in McKinney, Texas. Uh, we struggle with this as libertarians, right? He says, do you know of any attempts to sway people toward liberty from the emotional rather than the intellectual standpoint? I feel this is fertile, unplowed ground. And I think that's so true. If you look at a, at, at a political ad from Hillary, it'll touch the emotional heartstrings, and it's a very easy argument for our progressive friends to make. You know, don't you want to help children? Don't you want to provide for education? How do we touch people at a more visceral level instead of just always being an intellectual movement? Hmm. Well, that's tricky. I mean, you can do it. You can do it in a positive way and in a I don't know, negative is not the right word, but when I say negative, I mean you could give you could give examples of people who have suffered tremendous injustice at the hand of the state that can, I, I think, have some good effect. You could think of anybody in the world who's struggled with, with the FDA and they can't get a life-saving drug or uh, that sort of thing. But also you can do positive things. Um, f for instance, uh, a lot of the entrepreneurs that we know of and plenty that we don't, have really, really tremendous stories. And the ultimate success of these entrepreneurs really has nothing to do with the state, or entrepreneurs that we'd be interested in. And to show all the struggles they had to engage in and all the obstacles they had to overcome, I think can be a very compelling sort of story. But a lot of us spend so much time just focused on the politicians that we don't get to tell these kinds of stories that really give you the positive overview of what, of what th things can be you know, of, of innovation and the, the energy that goes into that and the commitment. So I'd like to see that. I'm, I'm not any good at that, but I'd like to see somebody do it. Ramiz is pointing out that whenever he looked at popular culture of his day, whether it was the movies or detective novels or whatever, the, uh, the villain was always a businessman. He said in, in every single instance. So this hasn't, this hasn't really changed much, but it's absolutely true that there are horrific stories of people who have suffered from the state uh, why don't, why isn't there, say, money available to make wonderful movies about them or documentaries? It's because, uh, in general, it's not a good idea to make the state look bad for people who want preferment from the state. So if you're a uh, very wealthy businessman of the wrong sort and you're getting all kinds of state contracts, uh, you can't promote stories of people, uh, people who've been horribly murdered by the drug police. You can't talk about People's lives have been destroyed by the EPA, and they're just you know horrific examples. You can't that would stir the emotions, uh, nor can you talk about people who've been so successful in serving their fellow fellow people, uh, and where the state is not involved. And at the very least, the state is an impediment to them. It's an impediment they overcame, um, so that it's politically correct. Political correctness rules it out. Uh, so. Um, doesn't mean it can't be done. Great artistry is required to do this right. Um, and too many you know, documentaries that I've seen, and probably you've all seen, uh, don't hold the attention, which is sort of the, ba the basic thing you have to do before anything else. Very difficult to do this. Very difficult to make a compelling 
movie or documentary or com write a compelling story about something that's really going to influence people and you want both emotionally and intellectually. Um, but there's a huge gap uh, waiting to be filled by people who have the talent, uh, by people who might be interested in, in supporting such a thing from a financial standpoint, people who might be interested in doing it as a, attempting to do it as a business. Uh, so there are many opportunities, but the whole culture, uh, the state and its, and its uh, official culture is, is, is against us, but that's nothing new. That's uh, been true for, maybe it's always been true, uh, but it's certainly been true for a very long time in this country. But we, it's still possible to circumvent it. It's still possible to, re, to refute it. It's certainly possible to refute it, to resist, and to show, show the truth in all, all, all forms of media. Um, so maybe did, somebody here is going to do that. Did anyone in the room see the Atlas Shrugged movies? Anybody emotionally touched, or did you find them badly done? Okay. I think we've got a consensus on that. And people spent a lot of money on those movies. And I mean, not as much as Hollywood blockbusters, but people spent a lot of money in that. And the idea behind that was that, gee whiz, we make all these intellectual arguments and we debate. And, and libertarianism is not just a soundbite of an ideology. Sometimes you have to explain A, B, C to get to D, right? Whereas a, a left progressive can just say, children, <laughs> right? And so people feel like, well, we have to find a way to be emotive. Um, but for whatever reason, those movies were flops and, uh, and, and a bit of a money waste, I must say. Um, so can we, let's get a question from the audience. I'm sure we have some people who haven't like to give a live question. This gentleman here. This is a question for either of you. I was wondering if either of you had an opinion of the former economist Henry George, I know that F.A. Hayek was a big fan of him early on. Well, I, not really, because I haven't read Progress and Poverty. So I, I think there's way too much of people speaking about things they haven't read because they heard it third hand or something. Um, so I don't want, I mean, I know he's laissez-faire except for the land tax. But then if you Google Murray Rothbard and Henry George, Rothbard has a response to George. The Georgists don't accept it. I, it's such a small group of people at this point that I just haven't made it a priority to, to master it. But I, I, I want to just, just to justify my abstention from jumping into this. Until I started writing books, I used to be the sort of person who would condemn some book I had never read just because I knew it was a bad book. And then when I saw people doing it to my books that they had never read, <laughs> I mean, it wasn't just that I thought, well, hey, that's not fair. Don't do that to my books. It genuinely changed me. I thought, that's just not right to do to anybody because it's rough work to write a book. And I owe that to any author in the world. So I pledged at that point, if I haven't read it, I'm just not going to comment. So there you go. Well, I'll just add, by, you know, Murray's... Murray's critique is very persuasive. On the other hand, he pointed out, I've only read in George. Uh, I've certainly not read all of Progress and Poverty or many other writings. He was a brilliant uh, opponent of protectionism and uh, very, very eloquent and uh, convincing still to this day. So if you give him that credit. Uh, plan, um, Murray's, one of Rothbard's laws was that everybody concentrated on what, concentrates on what they're bad at. So all the Georges today talk about, not all the places where Henry George was right, but they help just promote the, the, the single tax, the land tax. So um, it's too bad, but you know, that's history of thought. <laughs> well, here's a great question from uh, Shreveport, someone from Shreveport, Louisiana. Tom, were you forced to drop Tom Sawyer, the Rush song, because of PC? Oh, no, 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 no. In case you don't understand the question, the intro, the audio intro to my podcast used to have a little snippet of Rush in it. And the reason I got rid of it was that uh, initially my show was just like a, a, an offshoot of the Peter Schiff show, and it was hosted at SchiffRadio.com or whatever. And uh, they made me this beautiful intro. But the intro was like 60 seconds long, and for a half-hour show, that's the proportion is all wrong. But secondly, it had all these intellectual property issues with it that I, you know, yeah, maybe we don't like that, but we don't live in that world and I'm not going to jail. So, <laughs> and then I was assured by the shift people, don't worry about that. But why? And they say, look, Peter uses stuff all the time, you know, on his show, nobody cares. 
uh, that's not, oh, so then when I was on my own, I thought, okay, I don't have the Schiff radio empire behind me anymore. I'm not taking any more chances. So that was the reason. Well, so that means the great clip from The Simpsons is gone. And, oh, just, I can't believe you even brought this up. It's <laughs> devastating. Well, I will say this. Is I've, I've been a Rush fan since I was probably 17 or 18. And about six months ago, Neil Peart, the drummer from Rush, gave just an unbelievably moronic interview to Rolling Stone, and, and they didn't thought of it as a libertarianish band because they had the song Anthem, which was based off Ayn Rand's book, the same title. And, and Neil Peart, who's an unbelievable musician, and, and you can give him some slack because he lost his, his, his uh, uh, daughter in a car accident a few years ago, changed him. Um, but, you know, he said, he just said, he said something to the effect that well, clearly Rand Paul hates brown people. And, and it was just so facile and so off. It was just so unlike him. And, and, and uh, I, I've sworn them off since. It's the kind of thing that, uh, that you just can't tolerate, I think, in, a, in civil society. It was just a bizarre statement from uh, a guy who really ought to know better. So, no more rush. <laughs> Canadians, anyway. <laughs> Oh, they know this could lead to a this could lead to a foreign policy <laughs> blunder. We could invade them. <laughs> now, we, we, the good questions have really started to come in. Uh, Lou is going to like this. In order to be politically correct, the owner of the Washington Redskins will be forced to change the name of the team. Comments? Well, I certainly hope not. And so far, he hasn't done it. Um, so I'm one eighth Indian myself. Uh, the Abenaki tribe in uh, Canada and uh, northern New England doesn't bother me. I mean, I, I, as far as I can tell, uh, all the American Indians I've read, except the officials who were paid to, you know, be like the Indian end of LACP, they, they're offended. But as far as I can tell, no, nobody else is offended. And I hope the owner sticks to his guns. I hope, uh, but you, can, you know, you can't be sure, but it's just amazing considering everything that he's stuck to his guns this long and hasn't done it. Oh, just have to hope. This is for Tom. How big of a problem is PC within the Catholic Church? We'll treat you as a spokesman for all Catholicism. <laughs> and what is your, your personal strategy for overcoming it? <laughs> People expect too much from me, I find. <laughs> I get emails all the time. What are you going to do about this? Answer nothing. <laughs> I have five children, okay? I'm really busy. <laughs> nothing is what I'm going to do. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's as bad there as it is anywhere, basically, because the, uh, the, the, there's this misconception that, and I, I will defend this to anybody, th there's a misconception that uh, uh, John Paul II and uh, it's less of a misconception that Benedict XVI were conservatives. And so Francis is just this odd man out. That's just not right. I mean, Francis is definitely much different from those men, but they're all, they all travel in the same post-Vatican II world. I mean, it's like saying, you conservatives, I bet you all like Newt Gingrich. You know, well, Newt Gingrich? Like, that's the most, and like, for the media, that's the most conservative guy they can think of. Newt Gingrich. And that's, I mean, and John Paul and were like, was like Newt Gingrich. I don't mean that he was that trivial of a thinker. I, I mean, of w where he is on the, I, I mean, where he is on the spectrum. Like, John Paul II is much to the, and I, I, I reject everybody who says, there's no left and right in the church, just orthodoxy. Not true. There absolutely is left and right in the church. John Paul is, was very much to the left of Everybody who went before him, in, in, and I'm not just talking economics, it's just in area after area, whether it was scholastic philosophy, theology, uh, whether it was ecumenism, whether it was his ap attitude toward uh, politics or whatever, he was very much to the left. Um, you know, he, was a, he had some things that made him seem to a 20th century, late 20th century American to make him a conservative. But that's a pretty low threshold. I'm talking about by a Catholic standard, he was not a conservative. Um, so, uh, because we can't even diagnose the problem, it makes it tricky to come up with a solution. But yeah, it's, it's everywhere, it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenon everywhere, and, it's, and what's typical of, of political correctness is that leftism is tolerated in all its forms. M maybe there's a slight slap on the wrist for extreme leftism, but conservatism is rooted out and punished. 
So, you know, you have a priest who's, you know, he's, he's, he's wearing a clown suit, you know, or he's got a Detroit Red Wings hat or, or something. Uh, you know, whatever. They're doing the polka. That's not a joke. They're doing the polka. And that's considered, you know, liturgically okay. But you have a guy who, you know, just goes by the book and everybody reports him. What? He's just going by the book. I mean, why, why isn't he like Father Ted with his, you know, Detroit Red Wings hat? A anybody like that is rooted out. So it's a bizarre regime that's been in power for quite some time. And you have a few resistors around, but they are dwindling. And, if, and, and finally, if we thought John Paul was not, if we thought John Paul was a conservative, how did Francis ever get elected? There should not have been enough people in the, card, uh, uh, people in the College of Cardinals to elect Francis. So that's how we prove it. So I'm right about this. <laughs> this question's directed we'll cut at Lou. cut that part out of the video later. <laughs> this is directed at Lou. It says, Mr. Rockwell, I have long maintained the candidate most dangerous to liberty and thus most likely to win is Marco Rubio. What presidential candidate most frightens you? I, I guess I would say Rubio or Bush, but it looks like Ru it looks like Bush is. I noticed in the in the latest national poll, he's down to four uh, percent. So he's uh, he's plummeting. He's Trump was right. He's a loser. He's boring. Uh, nobody wants to listen to him. And uh, his his uh, uh, unfortunate brother, unfortunate for those of us he ruled anyway. Uh, unfortunately, also was an attractive personality to a lot of people. Um, Jeb can have all the exclamation points he wants after his name, it just doesn't, uh, doesn't do it. But Rubio uh, is, I would say, definitely the neoconservative candidate. They, they have, the neoconservatives have a slight distrust of, of, of Jeb, just like they did his dad. Doesn't mean they're good guys, but, you know, that's not all bad if the neoconservatives distrust you. Rubio, they love. Uh, he's totally controlled. Uh, somebody who's, who's uh, uh, works in national television and has dealt with all the Candidates told me recently that of all of them, Rubio is by far the stupidest, that he's like a moron. However, he has an ability to memorize things, so he can memorize phrases, he can memorize um, things to answer to questions, um, but it'll be typically just a rearrangement of the same phrases and whatever he's, whatever he's saying. Um, but he's totally, you know, he's... he's uh, the, is he a bad guy? I don't really care. The people who control him are very bad people who believe in constant war and vast expansion of the state. They believe in political correctness. They believe in, in uh, vast expansion of the welfare state, the warfare state, every, every, every aspect of So Rubio is, uh, and of course he's, people find him charming. He's a nice looking guy. Uh, but um, I would say, you know, right now he's, but they're all a problem. You don't want anybody, you know, one of the things about the president we're supposed to think is so wonderful is the, uh, uh, the nuclear codes, he's followed by a military officer who carries a box that in it has all the codes it needs to, to start to launch all the missiles from the submarines and the planes of Nebraska and the ships and the bombers. And I mean, the president, he has the power to destroy the world just on his own say-so. I mean, talk about tyranny. I mean, why should any man have that kind of, it's just an unbelievable outrage, but of course it's considered a great thing. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. It's a reason to really respect and love the president even more. So the presidency is a cancer, and uh, so you really don't want anybody exercising that cancer. Um, but right now, Rubio is the guy beloved of uh, Bill Crystal, for example. So t to me, that's a real, uh, that's a, a, a signal as to how bad he is. And Tom, who are you making your max donation to? <laughs> Oh, this is a great question. Th that, that chapter of my life is over. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good one. And uh, how should liber This is from Stephen Sebastian, Jackson, Mississippi. How should libertarians approach the Confederate flag? Well, I don't think it's a libertarian issue. I mean, it, it would, it, that's up to you. I think you can be a libertarian and have a complete... And this is not a cop-out answer. I think this is the plumb line answer. You can have any opinion on the, on the Confederate flag that you want. It depends on your view of history and so on and on. Um, I personally have no problem with it. I know people who do. I, there are people, who, people I respect disagree with me on this. A lot of times people I don't respect disagree with me, and I expect that. That's why I don't respect them. <laughs> but but there, are, there are people I, 
I mean, there's a guy I co-authored a book with who disagrees with me on this. So, so I mean, it actually has given me a, a bit of pause, but my, basically the way I look at it is that the vast majority of people, I mean, first of all, Jimmy Carter said the flag was okay. Like, we, we can't even keep up with the left's demands. So and now even Jimmy Carter's too right-wing for you? I mean, this, at some point, you've got to say, that's it, I, I, that's it. I'm not changing anything else. I'm not taking any more flags down. I'm not taking my shirt off. I'm not, that is it. I'm not going to try check every five minutes what the new outrage is. I'm just not doing it. So part of me feels like you've got to just resist the left in general. Um, but also, I, I think the typical person who uses it is just thinking, well, let's see. I mean, my ancestors suffered greatly. I, I mean, Jefferson Davis actually noted to people that in an emergency, rats are edible. I mean, that's how bad things were. And... A lot of these people were fighting because, well, what, am I, what else am I going to do? The northern people are coming to, to kill me. What am I supposed to do? Say, say to them, well, good Mr. Union soldier, sir, I know that I deserve your righteous wrath because of policy decisions made by my government, so I will just lie here while you burn the children and burn my city to the ground, for this is what I deserve. Who is going to say that? I don't care what the Confederate government was up to, but individuals, I can imagine them saying, I have to fight. What else can I do in this situation? And if you want to honor people who did that in that situation, good for you. That's my answer. <laughs> okay, this is, this is, did, did you want to mention I was going to say, I've, uh, the time I, I felt, I mean, I, I would agree with Tom, um, but I remember, I, I, thanks to the late Howard Phillips, I had the great experience of being in the Baltic states right at the very end of the Soviet Union, and people were beginning to demonstrate against the Soviet occupation. And uh, in both in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, uh, when you saw crowds, it was not unusual at all to have several people carrying a Confederate flag. So to them, it indicated secession and freedom. They weren't wanting to have slavery in Lithuania. <laughs> So it, it's, uh, I don't know, people, people look at it differently. And if they want to use it, perfectly fine with me. If other people don't like it, that's, you know, I, I would agree that's, that's fine with me too. Question from the audience. We have time for a couple more. This gentleman, be, we have a microphone. Okay. <laughs> Is that like heart disease? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, if, you look at a, if you look at the organization chart of the federal government, that's a terrible thing to ask you to do. You see, it's, you know, it's this, this gigantic oak of evil that's the presidency. And there's this little tiny Congress and little tiny Supreme Court. They're both evil. Uh, but I still think, that, I mean, I think the presidency is where the EPA and the IRS and the Pentagon and the CIA, I mean, the NSA, uh, every uh, evil thing you can think of that's oppressing you or uh, other people in the world is in the presidency. But Supreme Court, of course, is, uh, uh, went out of control with Marbury versus Madison very, very early on in the 19th century. Uh, there's nothing in the, uh, in the Constitution giving the Supreme Court the right to do things like it just did with the homosexual marriage decision. You just announce that this is now, quote unquote, the law. Uh, of course, the, I like the older tradition where the law consisted of the natural law or things in pursuit of the natural law, uh, and not just what five guys in uh, dresses can uh, announce to the world is this is now the law. You're going to jail if you don't, if you don't obey it. Um, so but the Supreme Court is, is awful. Uh, <laughs> but nobody's interested in doing anything about it. Ron Paul, very pro-life, always had the only... Um, practical, doable argument uh, I've ever seen for doing something if one's concerned about abortion. He said this, the, the, the Constitution allows the Congress to decide the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, except in some very narrow areas like suits between federal governments and the U.S. government or suits between the states. But pretty much everything the federal courts do is within congressional jurisdiction. He said you should remove abor abortion from the jurisdiction of the courts. He said which would immediately in effect, repeal Roe v. Wade, and then it would be a state issue, and therefore much less contentious and uh, um, 
more solvable by people on whatever people's views are, they could, they could uh, advance them at, at the state level. Well, of course, he couldn't get any Republican whatsoever, nobody, zero. And all the so-called pro-life organizations, uh-uh, they weren't interested, even though this was actually doable when you had a Republican Congress, a Republican president. Um, this is not subject to the Supreme Court being able to veto it. Um, but there was absolutely no interest, and I think because it would have worked. So the Republicans love this as an issue. They roll it out every four years. Mm. They talk about it for a, a short time, and then they roll it back in the garage until the next election. Mm. Um, they don't want to change anything more, any more than the Democrats do because it's such a great fundraising and volunteer and stir up the voters issue for the Republicans. Um, so that uh, Ron tried that all the time he was in Congress to get people interested. He got zero interest, even though it would have been a huge, you know, it would have been also just going along, it would have been a federalist, a federal approach, a decentralist approach. Um, but they were all afraid of the precedent. Why? But wait a minute, what if then, you know, X might be removed from the jurisdiction of the federal courts, which of course is great. X, Y, Z, A, B, C, all the rest. Uh, <laughs> But the Republicans and the conservatives were just as terrified of doing anything to the jurisdiction of the court as, as uh, liberals and Democrats. It was like unanimity on that question. I think we had a question here. Are you familiar with the, the pushback in the geek community of video games, comic books, sci-fi novels? Yeah. Against Julia Lutra? Yeah, yeah, it's been pretty strong in the past years. No, it's, tre it's tremendous. And of course, this is, I first became aware of it uh, be because of the left attacking the fact that there was resistance. I mean, they were all racist, they were all, you know, fascists or, you know, whatever, sexist, homophobes, all, you know, all the rest of the, the regular litany. And um, there's been real pushback in the science fiction community, in the video game community. So it's not entirely successful, but just the fact that there's been hardcore pushback and refusal to surrender, refusal to, in fact, roll over and ask for forgiveness uh, drives them crazy. So this is, uh, and, and, uh, I think uh, Larry Bean recommended uh, Vox Day's book on social, you know, just, you know, this is good. And, and uh, um, it's very encouraging. These are, and also they're was accused of being all male, all white males. But so what? I mean, if, if white, I, I don't know what the, what the demographics are of the video game business, but if it is all white males, so what? I mean, if other people, they're not keeping anybody else out. If um, black guys or Chinese guys or whatever would want to participate, I'm sure they'd be welcomed uh, to buy the stuff, among other questions. But um, uh, we're supposed to think they're evil because they're a bunch of young white guys and all uh, um, just resisting. So I think, it's, I think it's good. I think there are a lot of indications like this in society. There is resistance to the to political correctness, and those... Uh, they're all tr they're tremendous, and they're very motivated. They're strong, they're articulate, smart, all very smart. It's a great uh, it's a great subcultural pushback. I've even read uh, some opinions that uh, the GamerGate scandal actually represents a watershed movement, maybe the high water mark for out of control PC. We have a question over here. How do libertarians view continued growth in the economy and growth in the population on this finite planet? Well, I guess first from my perspective, I'm not sure we have much growth in the economy. I'm, I'm convinced that a lot of it is circular in that the sense that from an Austrian perspective, GDP is a nonsensical uh, figure that includes government spending and includes um, a, a lot of things that, that are not productive ac activity. Um, if you read David Stockman, uh, his country corner, he will argue that uh, there are, you know, net negative earnings in, in a lot of U.S. companies, a lot of U.S. industries. So I'm not convinced that we have all this this growth. Um, you know, the, the the overpopulation issue that's that's been raised a million times. It always seems that we we uh, have some apocalyptic future where we're going to exceed five billion, eight billion, ten billion, uh, and yet human beings tend to always adjust quite adroitly. So. Um, uh, I'll, you know, speaking personally, human overpopulation is about the last thing on my list of worries when it comes to the state. Um, I think we got about 99 problems before that.
Yeah, uh, well, there are a, f- a few things about it. I mean, I know there were all these interesting uh, thought experiments where you could take the entire population of the world, plop it in Texas, and everybody would still have a decent amount of square footage to live in. So it's worth bearing in mind. But also, uh, in, in terms of resources, uh, there's a thought that if we keep having economic expansion and growth, that uh, we're going to run out of things. Things will get depleted, and then we're going to have a real crisis on our hands. But this is why it's useful to remember that great, uh, very interesting debate. Now, I didn't agree with everything Julian Simon ever said, but the best thing he ever did was to debate Paul Ehrlich in 1980 over this 10-year th- This was episode 501, tomwoods.com slash 501. I did an episode on this because it's the 25th, because September 29th, 2015 is the 25th anniversary of the conclusion of this bet that these two had. Paul Ehrlich wrote The Population Bomb, and Julian Simon wrote The Ultimate Resource, The Human Mind. And he said to Ehrlich, I want you to pick any five commodity metals you want. Go ask all the experts, which are the ones that are going to be most likely to start being depleted and therefore correspondingly see their prices rise. And I will bet you a thousand bucks that none of those prices are going to rise. They're all going to fall because we will either... Uh, there are all kinds of reasons they could fall. We could find substitutes for them, or we, like for instance, with copper, we don't need that for telephone lines anymore, at least today anymore, and not as much. Um, we find substitutes, we find ways to get more out of less because of human ingenuity. And Ehrlich said, fine, sure, I'll take that bet. So Ehrlich went to the, he didn't just think of his own metals, he went to the experts. And 1990 came along, every one of them had fallen in price. So Ehrlich had to write a check to Simon, of course, saying that, well, you know, it's going to take a little longer, but it's going to be even worse than I I expected. I mean, Simon was, uh, Ehrlich was saying things like, by the year 2000, I don't think there's even going to be an England left. (laughs) And he was on, I found out on the show, he was on The Tonight Show almost two dozen times because he was very charming and whatever, and he would say these apocalyptic things, and none of them are true. And they look ridiculous in, in uh, the, the light of day. So uh, that, th- what you can get out of learning about that bet is very important to understanding these kinds of questions. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid that we are out of time. Thank you again so much for joining us today. And please come see us in Houston in January. Thanks very much. Thank